Yep. Technology. Most of us don't have to go very far to be in reach of it. I mean, just blam, what can I do with this thing that's measurable? But what I'm going to be talking about today is how screens and screen time have a negative effect on children. And by screens and screen time, I mean television, phones, and computers. So I'm going to prove that in three points. One, increasing amounts of screen time are raising the risk for childhood obesity. Two, increasing amounts of screen time have a negative effect on learning. And three, widespread use of cell phones and computers put children's privacy and safety at a higher risk. Okay, so first talking about childhood obesity. Kids are spending more time on screens, leaving less time for physical activity. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, a study has shown that the average eight to 10 year old spends nearly eight hours a day with different media, and older teens spend more than 11 hours per day. So let's break this down, there are 24 hours in a day. Your average kid goes to school for six to eight hours, so we're already down at 16. And then common knowledge is that you need about eight hours of sleep just to function normally, so now we're back to eight hours. So assuming this, they're spending the rest of their time just on screens. That doesn't leave any time to just go for a walk. So I mean, obviously you're gonna be gaining some weight if you're not moving around. Secondly, almost all food-related advertisements on television depict unhealthy food promoting poor diets. A study by Lisa M. Powell in 2013 found that among children two and five and six and 11, about 84.1% and 84.4% on advertisements on all programming, and 95.8% and 97.3% on children's programming were products high on NTL, which are nutrients per limit. So basically, we have 85% of advertisements on television are promoting disgusting food that's just bad for you and it's just gonna get you fat. And the even worst part is that about 95 to 98% of the advertisements on children programming is for unhealthy food. So my second point is on learning. The technology available and constant use of screens doesn't leave time for kids to learn or remember anything. Scientists at the University of California found that when rats have a new experience, like exploring unfamiliar terrain, their brain shows new patterns of activity, but only when rats take a break to do, only when rats take a break do they process the patterns and create memory. Recent imaging studies found that major cross sections of the brain become surprisingly active during downtime which suggests that periods of rest are critical in allowing the brain to synthesize information and make connection between ideas and even develop a sense of self. So kids are in constant mode of simulation, which doesn't give this the time, which doesn't give them the time to just relax and remember and let their mind process what they're doing. So they're having a hard time in school, they're having a hard time remembering anything. And then another point is that these advances in technology are supposed to be beneficial to learning but kids don't spend much time on schoolwork or homework with these devices. According to Matt Richel, children between the ages of eight to 18 who do use media such as the internet or television only spend about 35% of their screen time on homework and school related activity. They have the means to do great things with all of this internet access. I mean like, I can look up just about anything with my phone and get reliable sourcing and like it's just phenomenal what you can do with this technology but we have it and we're spending our time on Netflix or just watching videos of cats or dogs. Like we're not actually using the powerful resources in our smartphones to do educational things. And now on to my final point of safety, safety and privacy. The internet makes it easier for anon to be anonymous and stay hidden, which leaves children more open to being bullied online. According to statistics on Enough is Enough, making the internet safer for children and families, three out of four children have access to a smartphone. And according to bullying and cyberbullying resources, 25% of teenagers report that they have experienced bullying on their cell phones repeatedly. And 52% of young people report that they're being cyberbullied. So more than half of young people are being bullied online through their cell phones or through their computers. And this didn't necessarily happen until three out of four children had one of these in their phone. So now kids are just being picked on, like it's not necessarily a good thing. And then finally, uh, my final point is that since most children now have phones and have constant access to computers, it makes it easier for predators to prey on children through the web. A statistic has found that one out of 25 teens have received online sexual solicitations with the offender seeking to make contact. 
one out of 25 teenagers. You're assuming that in your average public high school, there are about 25 people per class. So that's like one kid in every single class in high school is just being, has been contacted by a sexual predator just wanting to do terrible things with them. So in conclusion, kids are spending so much time on screens and televisions, phones and computers that they are turning into couch potatoes and just gaining a significant amount of weight. And kids and teenagers have the access to the search engine which could help them improve in their school activity. I mean, like, it's really cool. Like, I know my mom always talked about how she wished that she had this kind of electronic with elect electronics when she was in high school, but she doesn't. And we have it, and we're not using it for the right reasons. And with the widespread use of cell phones and computers, kids are more exposed to being bullied and are being easily preyed upon online. All right, well, the contents are outlined really nicely. I think there's uh, plenty of controversy on this. I know what your subject is. You talk about it a little bit. I think you kind of skimped a little bit on the propositional statement, although I got most of it. Uh, I'd have to watch the speech again because I'm not quite sure that you gave us that uh, uh, explicit statement of the proposition, but I know exactly where you're going, so you're on the right track there. Uh, structurally, everything is fine. All of the secondary claims are phrased as declarative statements, easy to follow. I especially like that on each point you've got a nice explanation of the uh, theories and the ideas that are going on right there. Uh, usually you provide at least one piece of information for those supporting points to explain. Sometimes there's a little bit more information, so I think you're doing a very good job there. There are a couple of places where it's a little bit thin on some of these things. Uh, for example, on um, the, uh, the, the whole thing about our ability to learn uh, you've got a rat study, and uh, it talks about, you know, that the rats apparently need downtime. And I, I guess what you're trying to do is equivocate because we're on these devices or our kids are on these devices so much that they don't get that downtime, and as a result, they're not going to be learning. That's, I, I can see the explanation going on there. The demonstration that that is, in fact, true, I think, is what's missing. I think you need a little bit more information on that. On the bullying issue, the idea that kids are bullied to some degree. I do think you need to explain what constitutes bullying because I think there are some pretty broad definitions out there and uh, the fact that some kid gets called a name might be enough to for them to believe that they were bullied online. Um, and the, how it's different from example from being bullied in school directly why it's better to be bullied in person than it is to be bullied online I'm not quite sure and if there is a substantial difference in the amount of bullying that goes on in one and compared to the other that I think you need to develop a little bit more like I said that's a, a not a bad argument to make but it's a little thin here I think you need a little bit more information on it and uh, you got to be careful about the equivocation that you're making on 1 in 25 there at the end uh, that they've been solicited for sex doesn't necessarily mean that it was by a sexual predator it could easily have been, you know, a classmate, <laughs> which might make them a sexual predator, I suppose, but uh, not the kind of perverts that I think you're talking about. Uh, so that doesn't mean that that information is useless. It just means that you have to be careful that you don't overclaim on it. Uh, I think the best thing about the speech outside of the... Uh, excellent way in which it's organized and the and the arguments are explained is its presentation. You look at us the whole time. You know the argument that you're trying to make. Uh, you're pretty confident when you're expressing yourself to us. You look very animated and that, and that sells your credibility a lot. All right. Thank you.